Hey guys, so after sending out that um, last poll that I did this week, I realized that a lot of you who are in this group recognize that you were not taught how to be an intuitive eater as a child. And believe me, if that was your answer, like you're definitely not alone. I have very few clients that I work with that actually discovered that they, um, that a lot of their, their I don't want to say issues, but some of the the things that came up around food started at a really young age, right? Like we've been uh, sent certain messages and have certain beliefs around food that um, started when we were really little, right? So we've lost touch with our natural hunger cues and oftentimes we find ourselves eating from a lot of different spaces that don't necessarily result to or have any relationship to hunger itself, right? So like the cellular hunger. So I want to talk about some different, um, a, a different way to look at hunger that has been really helpful for the clients that I've worked with. And I'm just going to touch on these. Um, there's different exercises that we can go into to talk about how to figure out which types of hunger um, you're having in the moment. But I hope that this small presentation or I guess <laughs> little Facebook Live uh, gives you a little bit of insight into your hunger and what it could be inspired from if it's not being inspired from that natural hunger cue. I call it cellular hunger. It's like when you your body actually needs food for energy, right? Which is where we where we eventually want to eat from on a regular basis is from that cellular need for energy and for replenishment. So um, I'm going to go over these seven types of hunger. Um, and then you can just take some notes or make some mental notes about like, what, what does that mean for me? How do I experience this type of hunger? And I want to also say that these types of hunger are not, um, bad or wrong. Like we eat for a lot of different reasons and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we eat for, uh, because we're triggered by, um, a situation, a smell, and I'm going to go into that a little bit here. So let's just, let's just dive in. Um, so the first type of hunger is eye hunger. So that's the type of hunger that leads us to eat when we're already full. Um, so, you know, like if you're with some friends and at, at a dinner and someone bring, and the server brings out his or her dessert menu, you've already had a nourishing full on meal, right? And, but the, just the look of, and the, um, sight of some of the desserts on other people's tables is enough to inspire you to say yes to dessert. Okay. So it's also the same thing as like, um, watching commercials and you see that a Whopper is, uh, <laughs> is on the television commercial. You're instantly hungry, even if you didn't feel sensations of hunger before, right? That's considered I hunger, right? And again, I want to just say, state again, there's nothing wrong with these types of hunger. These are natural types of hunger, but these sometimes trigger us to eat. Um, the second type of hunger is nose hunger, okay? So the sense and the flavors, or the sense and the flavors that we smell through our olfactory system are connected right into our limbic system of our brain. This is our emotional control center, okay? And that entices us to eat. So just consider when you walk into the movie theater and you smell the popcorn, you may have not been hungry before, but as soon as you smell that buttery popcorn, Popcorn, you're instantly like, yes, I am going to have some popcorn with this movie. It's triggered by the smell. Um, another one that I think about is coming home from a long day at school. Hi, everybody who's watching. It's nice to see you. Please feel free to tell me you're here. Say hello. I don't know exactly who's here, but I can see it when you comment. So <laughs> say hi if you're interested in saying hello. Um, just talking about the seven types of hunger if you're just jumping on. So um, so nose hunger is, yeah, again, that you know your nose does the eating first, right? That smell is what triggers the salivation and therefore the need to eat. The third type of hunger that a lot of us are um, that a lot of us are influenced by is mouth hunger. Okay, and this is one eye hunger and nose hunger make a lot of sense, but mouth hunger is something that I think a lot of us experience, but we don't realize, and that's the this idea that we have this sensation junkie. Okay, so we constantly desire exciting flavors and textures. Um, if we don't pay attention to what we're eating, so if we don't pay attention to those textures and flavors. If we're eating mindlessly in the car, standing up while we're feeding our kids, we don't satisfy this type of hunger. 
because we're not allowing the experience of mouth hunger to happen for us, at least cognitively. It might be happening, but we're not truly inviting the sensation to be satisfied, right? In order for us to meet satisfaction, we actually have to satisfy these different types of hunger to feel truly full. And mouth hunger is something that I see a lot of my clients um, kind of glaze over, like they're short on time, they don't have um, the energy to sit down for a meal or they're on the go all the time. So they're constantly bypassing, they're constantly bypassing, hi Erica, oh someone else said hi too. Oh Cindy and Megan and Tony. oh and now I'm seeing it. it's all coming through. So seeing all of you guys here. So hi Michelle, Veronica, Erica, Cindy, Tanya, Megan, awesome to see you guys. Oh, Nana's here. Um, Emily, awesome. Okay, so a lot of us bypass these different um, hunger cues because we're not being mindful at our plate. Therefore, those these types of hunger never get satisfied. And it's important for us to feel fully nourished that we're satisfied through all of our senses, through all these different types of hunger that I'm talking about right now. So mouth hunger, right? It's the craving of different flavors and textures and, and different things on our plate. That's one reason as a dietitian, I've always recommended people fill their plate with different textures or when they're feeding young children to make sure that there's crunchy and salty and sweet and well, those are, yeah, those are flavors, um, but there's different uh, textures as well. Smooth or creamy, milky, you know, all these different things actually provide sensation to that sensation junkie in our mouth that helps support satiety and fullness. So that's pretty cool, but we have to pay attention. If we're not paying attention to it and we're eating on the go, we're never gonna satisfy our mouth hunger. So I hope that makes sense. If you resonate with that, please, you know, shoot me a, a comment there. Let me know. Send, give me some sort of like love with the, um, the heart or the thumbs up. Um, so mouth hunger is one that a lot of people bypass. So we have to watch out for that one. Now, the fourth type of hunger is cell hunger. So cell hunger is that craving that I talked about initially at the very beginning of this, um, Facebook Live is that it's the craving for what our body actually needs, right? It's cellular hunger comes from our cells, it's from the, every, you know, we're made of trillions of cells and cellular hunger is the, is the, um, the craving for nutrition, right? It's the craving for the different macronutrients and micronutrients that we study in nutritional sciences, right? It's what our body needs to function optimally. And in my dietitian brain and through my study of functional medicine, I looked a lot at cellular hunger and what the body needs to operate optimally, right? So there's lots of information there that you can get on the internet, that you can get through a dietitian or a nutritionist that you work with uh, based on your own personalized needs. But cell hunger can also be tapped into without all of that outside voices. Okay. So that's really important. That's a lot of the work that I do with my clients is teaching them and training them how to use all of these different types of hunger, uh, to recognize them, to see them, to understand them so that they're better able to tap into what I call an inner nutritionist. It's that ability for us to know what to eat and how much to eat without relying on a whole bunch of outside sources. Okay. And it's a journey. It takes time, but cellular hunger tends to come up to the, when we bring awareness to it, it is really beautiful to see how people naturally shift their diet towards quote unquote healthier foods when they're paying attention. Okay. When they're paying attention, when they're feeding their eye hunger, nose hunger, mouth hunger, and the rest that I'm about to talk to. Okay. So I'm just, I have a few notes in front of me. So thank you guys for bearing with me here. We got cellular hunger. The next one is stomach hunger. Now, what is this? This is, you know, when you feel that physical, tangible hunger pain. But here's the thing. They're not always felt because we need energy. It's not the same as cellular hunger. We actually need the energy. It's actually really common, and I do see this with different clients, that they start to confuse um, the anxious feelings in the gut for hunger as an example, right? So let's just think about the college student who's getting ready and prepping for big exams. Maybe this has been you at some point in your life. You are anxious and you get that gurgling in your stomach, right? Like, ooh. and I, I feel like a lot of people I work with connect with this one because there is so much anxiety in our culture right now. There's so much, especially right now in 2020 where we are sitting, there is so much of that. And we have this, this digestive system that we just think processes our food is actually a complex neural network. It's a lot like 
our second, well, science and researchers call our second brain, the brain in our gut. It is incredibly intelligent. Again, um, I love to teach people about this because it's so empowering to know that we don't just have a brain in our brain. We actually have a brain in our gut, okay? And it is so incredibly brilliant and intelligent. And when we can tune into that, when we can tap into that gut brain and recognize the things it's trying to tell us, right? So we connect our gut brain to our head brain. So the logic meets the gut. Also, there's the heart brain too. That's a whole nother Facebook Live. But we connect those two. We start to understand that anxiety, the feelings of fluttering of the stomach of anxiety are actually much different than true hunger pains that come and stem from that cellular hunger that I just previously talked about, right? So stomach hunger is... Um, sometimes confusing for people and they have to wrap their heads around that a little bit and start to really pay attention to those different feelings that we get in our stomach. Um, in Japanese culture, actually businessmen, this is so fascinating, I, I love this. There's a businessman who doesn't make decisions, like if he's sitting at a, a, a round table, okay, with a whole bunch of um, people and they're trying to make some business decision, he doesn't think about it with his logical brain, he makes the decision, yes or no, based on his gut feeling. You've heard of it, it's an expression we use all the time. What's your gut feeling about this, right? Hi Anna, Alex, Ashley, nice to see you guys. We're just talking about the seven types of hunger if you just hopped on. Um, so please go back and start from the beginning if you would like. Um, stick with me here, but go back and review the previous four types of hunger we've already talked about. Um, but yeah, so that gut brain, so, so, so intelligent. And so if we can tap into and start to um, understand the difference between anxiety, where, where we sometimes want to eat, eat just to fill that anxiety versus um, eating for actually cellular need, it can make a profound difference in how we approach food and body. Now, as I was saying, this Japanese businessman, he will sit in round table and if he has digestive issues during the actual situation, um, about a decision being made important for his money or whatever, he will decide based on his digestive function, not his logic function of his head brain in making a decision. And that's what he attributes his success um, in his business to, is that ability to tap into the enteric nervous system or the gut brain. So that's kind of fun, just a little side tangent there. So the next two forms of hunger are the two that, um, again, I focus a lot of attention on when I'm working with people, but that is mind hunger. So mind hunger, so this is number six, is what the mind tells us based on the latest scientific study um, or because of a life situation. Now this is something that I let take over for me when I was about 10 years ago, um, as I was a new dietitian coming out of school, I allowed all of the information, and this is the same thing that a lot of my um, people that I work with co confront against too. They, they're like, okay, this person says this is the best food to eat, good food, bad food, right? Or I should eat less fat, or I deserve a brownie because I exercise. These are all based on science, which is beautiful. I love science, I'm not against science but it tends to take over. Mind hunger tends to take people over, especially when they find themselves needing a meal plan, needing um, a, a diet in order to stay, quote unquote, on track, to manage their weight, to stay healthy, et cetera, so forth. I also call this the quote unquote, no diet, K-N-O-W, right? You almost know too much about food that you cannot tap into those other sources of hunger, those other types of hunger, to recognize what your body really needs. So you tend to over analyze food, you tend to think of too much about the decisions that you're making, and it can honestly take over and put us in a state of overwhelm. So there is freedom from that. There is a way to dampen the spirit of mind hunger and, and trust it. Um, because I think nutrition science has a huge place. I mean, obviously I studied it for years. I am I consider myself an expert in nutrition from the mind, uh, the mind space, the head space, but I've also seen that it's so important for true healing, especially when it comes to relationship with food and body, for us to 
recognize that this kind of hunger, the mind hunger can be a little obtrusive and come into play when we are navigating what foods are best to eat ultimately for our body, not the lady on the internet or the person on the news broadcast or heck even me, you know, as a dietitian, I'm always telling patients, you know, what to eat to heal their autoimmune disease or their digestive, whatever. And I always preface that by saying, Hey, this is what the research says, but we also have to work with you and your body to determining what's best because there's life situation. There's all kinds of things going on that will, um, that will change and shift what works for the individual. Okay. So that's mind hunger. And then the seventh type of hunger is one of my favorite ones to talk about. And that is heart hunger. And that's when we seek out food that helps us feel happy when we're feeling emotionally empty. Yeah, this is part of being human. Okay, there's nothing I always tell people, you know, they're like, Oh my god, I'm an emotional eater. Good for you. All of us are right. All of us eat want to eat fried chicken and mashed potatoes when we're sad. Well, maybe not all of us, but um, I always like to go towards ice cream. That's kind of my like overwhelm food. Like I feel like ice cream kind of takes me out of my space. It helps me numb out to what's going on. And it just gives me that like instant sense of pleasure. This is a lot. Uh, this is very common with sugary foods and really fatty, salty foods because they trigger certain hormone reactions in our brain and our body to help us feel soothed and soft. And they feel they're feel good hormones, right? and we like to feel good. As humans, we're supposed to feel good and there's nothing wrong with that. So emotional eating really stems from this heart hunger, right? Um, you know, it never, uh, food, never, the thing to recognize about heart hunger is that food never actually satisfies heart hunger, right? Food never satisfies heart hunger ever. Um, and so when when working with people, it's a lot of inside work that we have to look at when we're having that conversation with ourselves, with our plate, when we're eating and consuming from a space of heart hunger to just get really honest with ourselves, tap in. You know, I use a lot of breathing techniques. Um, that's where mindful eating can really help with this uh, process of kind of coming confronting heart hunger if it's kind of taken center stage in our eating patterns, but really trusting ourselves, learning to trust ourselves to metabolize those emotions. We metabolize more than just food, right? We metabolize thoughts. We metabolize emotion. We metabolize experience, right? We are metabolizers of more than food and our heart knows that and our heart has to metabolize emotions. Um, it can't do it through eating food. Okay, so it's really important to recognize that heart hunger, it has a place and there's nothing wrong with it. However, comma, when it takes over, it becomes emotional eating and that can, if used as a coping mechanism, can, 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 you know, can be challenging for people's health, right? So um, if you find yourself <laughs> or you call yourself, and I don't like labels because I don't, you know, I think we're all evolving and changing, but if you call yourself an emotional eater, then it's really important to take time and really look at this heart hunger and, um, and, and figure out what it is for you that your body's really craving, right? Is it craving personal connection? Is it craving, um, a solution to an answer? Is it, what is it craving? Right. And those are questions that, you know, I work with people on to help them understand, to un uh, pack a little bit of this um, information. So, um, so those are the seven types of hunger. So if you guys just jumped on, thanks for being here. I see Aaron and Jody. Um, I'm not, it doesn't tell me exactly who's still watching, but say hello in the comments if you'd like. Um, if you have any questions about anything I've talked about, um, of course, I love, I love interacting with people while they're watching. Um, that's super fun. Oh, I got a thumbs up. That's cool. Um, so, so anyway, please let me know. Um, but these seven types of hunger, I'm talking about them because of what I saw in a poll that I put up earlier this week around were you raised as an intuitive eater? And the very blaring answer from that poll was no. I think I had 20 people. Oh, hi, Erica. Good. <laughs> um, I had 20 people or so, maybe more than that, say that they were not raised as an intuitive eater. So, um, or a mindful eater, and maybe you don't even know what that is, but basically tr an intuitive eater is somebody who can regulate their food intake without looking at a book, putting it in an app, um, and they trust their body's fullness and hunger cues 
Um, an intuitive eater is somebody who knows what foods are gonna make them feel good and they actually choose them, not from a space of, oh, I quote unquote should eat that, but from a space of, oh, that's what I need to nourish my body. That actually ties into that cellular hunger, really re-engaging with the cellular hunger, understanding the stomach hunger, trusting you know the mind that the mind hunger doesn't know everything, and then tapping deeply into um, the heart hunger and really recognizing what the body really needs. So, um, Cindy, you said, I have also heard that thirst can be mistaken for hunger. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, that is, that is true. Absolutely. You know, if somebody is chronically dehydrated or not drinking enough water, that's an absolutely beautiful way to check in first is to drink a glass of water. Um, as a young dietitian, you know, I'd always recommend people eat a salad or a broth based soup before dinner to really ensure that they're, um, rehydrating. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think that's still a great tip and you can totally do that if you feel like you're overeating at mealtimes is to a make sure you're hydrated before meals and then start, you know, your meal with a broth based soup or a salad just to help, um, you know, it's called, it's kind of a volumetrics uh, method of filling the, the stomach um, up with a little bit of um, water-based foods just to help regulate appetite. But when we trust ourselves and we're an intuitive eater, I don't feel like we absolutely need that um, necessarily. Like I don't always have a soup before dinner. I just don't. Sometimes I go right into the steak and potatoes, right? And I don't, I don't want a soup. I don't want a salad. It doesn't sound good to me. So it's about, again, trusting yourself too. But the, the hydration piece, yeah, it absolutely can come into play. Um, so it's, your, your, our body senses thirst um, as hunger. So instead of our body telling us we're thirsty, it actually tells us we're hungry first before it tells us we're thirsty, if that makes sense. So, um, so that can be a kind of a way to navigate that staying hydrated is important for sure. So anyway, you guys, um, this is the seven types of hunger. Actually, um, the author, I wrote her name down. Her name is Jan Bays and she's written a book, um, called mindful eating a guide to rediscovering a healthy and joyful relationship with food. So I just want to let you know, I did not make these seven types of hunger up, but I do use them as a tool for understanding and learning more about ourselves, which is an important part of reprogramming our relationship with food and body. So I hope that they were helpful for you. If you're listening to this live, if you're listening to the recording later, let me know what you think. Tell me how this lands for you, how it feels for you to hear about these different types of hunger. I'm also really curious, what type of hunger do you experience most often? right? Like as I went through those, was there one type of hunger that you felt was more um, prevalent in your life than another? Or maybe you, you're like, holy crap, I'm a heart hunger person. Like I'm all about the heart hunger, right? Or maybe um, you didn't know that stomach hunger sometimes had to do with anxious feelings and trusting um, the gut and that gut brain, you know, um, that association, which is again, a completely another other topic um, that I'll have to pop in um, sometime with as well. So, um, and then lastly, if you guys are watching this, um, just know that I'm going to be sharing, um, a free training next week, uh, Thursday at 12 PM mountain standard time. I'm going to be diving in a little bit deeper into some of this stuff and kind of teach you all, uh, who are interested how, um, how, how I navigated this for my own self and how I help patients do the same thing so that they can find their healthiest weight for the long term. Okay. And I say healthiest weight. I don't, I don't necessarily like to promote weight loss because I don't always, I think every body is a good body, right? Our size does not, does not dictate our worth, um, our ability to feel love or experience life in its fullest. Um, so I always, I, I like to use the, the term healthiest body because I just, I, I, I don't want to pry or like um, waste time on weight loss per se, but I find that the clients who work with me that embrace this, if weight loss is a part of that, is um, is a natural and effortless thing, right? It's a side effect. It's always a side effect of reconnecting with the body, right? And getting healthy. So Erica said, heart hunger for the <laughs> all. Embrace that, Erica. So I just want to encourage you right now, like embrace it. Sometimes, you know, again, I will tell people who, who experience a lot of heart hunger or emotional eating that, you know, this is, this has been something for you. This has been something to nourish you through those hard moments in life, right? When you may have not had something else to nourish you, right? 
So, um, you know, we use a lot of coping mechanisms in our society. Some people use drugs or alcohol, other people use food. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, self abandonment when we, when we move towards those things. But once we have the awareness and we recognize it, that's our opportunity to change it. Right. So just recognize that when your heart hunger has been, you know, a big part of your life, like that's, that's okay. That's actually helped you get through whatever it is that you needed in the moment. Right that you needed to get through that emotional struggle, whatever it was, right? And no, food did not solve the issue in that moment, but it probably gave you some temporary relief and that is completely okay. What we're, what we're trying to do here is expand the awareness around that and make a decision to change because we all have that capacity to change. I truly believe that. Okay. It's like reprogramming. <laughs> There's neural pathways in our brain that we can reprogram to help serve our highest good. Okay. So, and then, um, Cindy says stomach hunger due to medications. Oi. Okay. Yes. So important. That's a, you know, it's like a whole nother level, right? Is talking about how medications and these different environmental influences can, um, can actually come into play. Right. Um, because th those are, you know, factors outside of our control in many cases. Um, and with my study of functional medicine, um, I recognize that, right? Like this is one piece of a big puzzle, right? There's not a panacea of health. There's not one thing that's going to do it. We have to take charge of all the things, but recognizing that the medications are playing into that, that awareness that you generate with that, that realization can give you some control back, right? It's the same thing when I talk to people about environmental toxins, you know, environmental toxins are pervasive in our society we can do things to mitigate our exposure to them, right? We can do things to get less, have less toxins in our home and, and whatnot. Again, completely different save Facebook Live, but those actually can influence the way that we metabolize our food, hold on to or lose weight, right? Can actually have to do a little bit with toxic exposure and gene expression and all these things, right? So there's, there's all kinds of things at play here. Um, that I could dive into, but, but really starting from this space of awareness is so empowering. It's, it's, it's not just empowering, it's necessary if we're somebody who wants to get healthy in all the ways and, and start to make changes from that space of curiosity and awareness versus that space of, oh, that mind hunger takes control. Oh, I should do this. I'm a bad person if I do that, right? That's what we're trying to break free of. Um, and Erica said, yes, I really want to change it. And that is beautiful, Erica. That's the first step, right? Is just wanting to change it. Um, and stick around, you know, I'll have more information for you as time goes on. Um, ask questions. I want to hear from you guys as to what's working for you, what's not working for you. Where are you struggling when it comes to the seven types of hunger, right? What type of hunger t tends to take charge, t take control? Okay. Hi, Tracy. I am just actually wrapping up, but I'm so glad that you popped on. Um, if any of you are kind of popped in towards the middle or the end of this live, please, uh, I will post the recording right now and you can go back and rewatch it to really uh, hear more about the seven types of hunger and how they can relate to you, building awareness, becoming a more mindful eater, et cetera, and so forth. So um, I'm going to say goodbye. So thank you guys for watching. Thank you for uh, the questions, the interaction, the hearts, all the love. I love it. Um, I'm glad to be here in this space with you guys. So take care and have a wonderful Thursday. We'll see you later.